this challenge on its head. Um, so to repeat that, <laughs> I would like to turn the standard perspective that people have on the challenge that we're addressing today on its head. And I would like to talk about how all students, the education system, and ultimately our society benefits from including students with disabilities. And in fact, we need individuals with disabilities in our classrooms, and the designs that we construct to accommodate these students will benefit all students. I'm also going to uh, hopefully show an example of text-to-speech that Olaf has, has spoken about. And Andrea, I have a, a captioned 10 minutes anyways of something for the individuals who are joining who require captions online. So um, I've titled my talk, One Size Fits One Inclusive Learning, as opposed to One Size Fits All Inclusive Learning. And if I could have the second slide. Um, there's been much talk uh, lately about uh, the global economy, the uh, economic disrupt, the transformation that technology has occurred in our economy. And one of the things that is, is quite clear is that education becomes ever more important, that prosperity of our society is dependent on educational development of all of its members. And because of the transformation, the, the change in industrialization, the changes in manufacturing, the changes that um, all of these technologies have affected on our society, we really need to retool our educational practices. And one of the things that we've learned is since we are no longer producing students who are going to be staffing an industrialized society, but a knowledge economy, we require a diversity of learners, a diversity of perspectives, not a number of standardized learners. But at the same time as there is this greater pressure on education, as education becomes ever more important in our economy, um, we have a global education dilemma. In fact, we have many, but I'm going to talk about one. Um, we have a greater diversity of students, and this is caused by migration, by an increase in um, individuals who have disabilities. But at the same time, because of our budget constraints and because of the woeful way in which we treat educators, unfortunately, uh, educators have less time to prepare curriculum, more curriculum to cover, and they're finding it difficult to address the needs of the average student, let alone if there is such a thing as an average student, let alone students with disabilities, alternative learning needs, or language barriers. And so what we're finding is that there is an increase in marginalized, disenfranchised students. And this is occurring globally. It's not just a European or a North American challenge. At the same time, we're relearning some important lessons in this global uh, digitized learning environment. We have relearned that learners learn differently. Um, each of us has a very different approach to learning. Um, we learn optimally under different conditions. And we found that the best learning outcome is when learning is personalized. And this doesn't only apply to individuals with disabilities. So we have the opportunity in a digital system to rethink our definition of disability. And rather than thinking of it as a personal trait, to see it as a relative condition, where disability is a mismatch between the needs of the learner and the learning environment offered. This means that we don't need to view students uh, only students who have a classic definition of disability as potentially being disabled in a classroom. Any student that is where the uh, environment, the lessons offered, the style of presentation, the conditions <coughs> perhaps even um, in coming to class are not meeting their particular needs can be seen as experiencing a disability in a classroom. And therefore, accessibility is the ability of the learning environment to adjust to the needs of the learner. But how does this address the education dilemma that I spoke of earlier? Well, one of the other um, interesting things that has been happening is a movement that you'll hear a little bit more about um, tomorrow, the open education movement and the open education resource uh, efforts that are happening globally. And uh, next
next slide. So what are open education resources? They're a, a growing global pool of diverse resources. And the interesting thing about open education resources is that most of them are what we call born digital. digital. And as Olaf was talking about, um, they, they are starting out in the format that, uh, as opposed to paper, they're starting out as digital items. And so they can be transformed and reconfigured, they can be enlarged, they can be spoken, they can be transcribed or reorganized if a few simple design principles are followed, such as the DAISY standard or <laughs> uh, the EPUB standard. And the other interesting thing is they're under an open license. Um, that means that anybody can reuse them, repurpose them, take them, create derivatives, change them, modify them, um, and add to them, and then give them back to the general pool. And so the, the question is, can this diversity of resources serve to address the needs of the diversity of learners? And so what Make it full screen right there. Perfect. And if we don't have sound, it's fine because there's captions. Flexible learning for open education, flow. Personalized learning resources for the diverse classroom, part of the global public inclusive infrastructure. Teacher stands at complex podium. Hi, I'm Liz Desan, high school biology teacher. You all know how important education is or you wouldn't be here. I want to talk with you about my classroom, where the magic happens, and sometimes where it doesn't. And what happened the day I invited one of our lead teachers to visit us? We are in a classroom with Mr. Sam, a visiting teacher, Ms. Emerson, and two students. Thanks for coming by today, Ms. Emerson. So, let me explain what goes on in this classroom, for real. Everyone in the class gets the same assignment, so we can work together and I can manage the curriculum. But I've learned over the years that each student has different ways to learn. Some of them can adapt to the education we provide. For many, it does not fit, and they reach the limit of their ability to adapt. 
This leads to frustration, failure, and disengagement. Susan and Monique, can you talk about that? Sure, Mr. Fan. I think I'm a pretty good student, but I do have some difficulty reading small type, or if the lines are too close together, or if there are too many words on the page. It takes me a lot longer to finish a chapter. Sometimes I miss deadlines, or just give up. There are a lot of videos in our class. Everyone else in the class really likes them, but I can't hear what's being said, and speech reading doesn't always work either. I really need captions. And I really need a way to help both of them. Printed books are only available in one format, and even electronic books are pretty limited. The videos I want to use rarely have captions. It's frustrating for me too. I see. What we need here is a way to take each learning resource and transform it differently for each student, adding the accessibility features that each one needs. Right. Is there anything like that? I think there is. It's called flexible learning for open Apologies. education. No. Flow can transform any learning resource, add features like captioning to it, or find an equivalent resource that works for each <coughs> learner. <coughs> Susan and Monique, you don't have to struggle in class. Flow can make sure the resource matches your needs. Cool. All right. And Mr. Seth, it's simpler than it seems. Much of the curriculum you already use can be transformed, supplemented, or substituted based on the student's individual learning needs. Super cool. But what's the profile? And how do I know which resources can be transformed? Where do we get things like captions or alternative learning materials? And how do we pay for a dog? I have to say, this sounds too good to be true. Hmm. Lots of good questions. I need to show you how Flow works, starting with the idea of the personal profile. Can you all meet me later in the computer lab? Later, in the lab, the group gathers around a student working on a computer. Gabriella is using Flow's tools for discovering what works best for her as a learner and storing this in her profile. I've used this tool. It helps you try out different options and narrow it down. Right. And your profile includes all the devices you use, the features you want, and when you want them. I'm here to update my profile for a new smartphone I just got. So a flow profile works for classroom materials and the devices you use to work on them. Yes, and because flow is part of a larger effort called GPII, my profile will soon work for things like my TV at home and the ATM at the bank. After I updated my profile, I also gave feedback about last week's article. Flow uses that feedback to improve how it works and to improve the resources. I'm learning about how I learn best and my profile reflects that. Okay, I get the idea of the profile, but how does it get connected with my class assignments, books, articles, websites, videos? I'm done with my edits. I put the flow matching tool on the screen so you can see how it works. See you later. Thanks, Gabriella. Mr. Seth, why don't you have a seat and give it a try? I'll walk you through it. Okay, this form looks simple enough. What's first? Go ahead and select the learning goal and resource. Okay. It's showing me the original page from the Animal Diversity website. Now go back to the form and select the profile you want Flow to match. Let's do Susan first, and we will build her profile as we go. I see the part marked text transformations. It worked. Now it's showing the same page with the text format Susan needs. Great. Can I see my version? Sure. Let me put your profile in the form. Here is with captions and a transcript for the video. Amazing. Don't change a thing. I'm going to do my homework right now. Next day in the classroom. That flow system is great. I bet my cousin could use it. He's got dyslexia. I bet a lot of cousins could use it. We see an open landscape with many learners. Connections rise up from them. You're right. Maybe there's only one person in each classroom who needs a textbook some <coughs> special way, but think how many classrooms there are in the world. The connection pipes rise and grow together to form a network in the sky. Exactly. 
Flow helps people all over the world find the materials that work best for them, one person at a time, and we don't have to store any of it. There are repositories up in the cloud that store and categorize everything. When someone needs something in a personalized format, Flow links them to the right location in the right repository. We see a request come up the pipe, and learning materials flow back down. And we've connected. Part of a global network. A few weeks later, the two teachers meet in front of the school. Hi, Wanda. Hi, Liz. So, how's it going with Flow in your classroom? Pretty good. I'm certainly finding a lot of the books, articles, and videos I need. Where does it all come from? Open educational resources are coming in from everywhere, educators and curriculum producers all over the world. But teachers may be the biggest source. Yes, I noticed that every teacher I know creates materials for the classroom. I've got hard drives full of them. Maybe I could share them. We see teachers working on computers, connecting to the Flow network. Right, the network needs you. Flow has tools that will let you contribute those materials. You can also take a resource that someone else has created, modify it for one of your students, and then put that version in the repository along with the original. We see the flow up from teachers and volunteers into the repositories. And someone else will do that with my materials for one of their students. Like a potluck dinner, everyone brings something different. The more diverse the materials that are up there, the more learning needs we can address together. Also, teachers and students give feedback about how well a resource worked. That helps Flow make better matches for that student and other students with the same requirements. Feedback from a student polishes a resource in the repository. This is definitely going to work. I think even the administrators are liking the idea. We get more materials for better teaching and learning So this is, the, and apologies for the somewhat um, kludgy or uh, yes, no, no apologies. Okay, Andrea says no. <laughs> uh, but this is uh, one of the systems, and the notion here is that not only is it helping individuals with disabilities or students with disabilities, but ensuring that every student, even um, what are you are the only party in the conference. If your meeting was interrupted, please remain connected to allow others to rejoin. Okay. Uh, what, what we're finding are one of the, the student groups that's been identified that this is in fact quite helpful with is uh, what are termed as doubly marginalized students. And these are students that don't qualify for special education in many jurisdictions and yet are not benefiting from uh, standardized education. So they fall, they fall through the cracks in many places. Uh, this also addresses those needs. So individuals that are not labeled as, or not certified, or do not qualify, um, and yet are not benefiting from uh, current education systems. The, uh, uh, Mr. Parklands had said that I would talk about ISO. Well, in fact, um, this particular technology and the consortium and the number of schools and jurisdictions that are working on them are enabled by a ISO standard, ISO 24751, which allows um, a common language for declaring how you need and want education to be delivered and a common way of describing resources. And so uh, hopefully uh, this you will uh, learn more about this or that it, it will become more pervasive throughout the education system. Um, and uh, we will create a one-size-fits-one learning environment for more learners and therefore accommodate a greater variety, a greater diversity of, of learners.